Hi everyone, this lesson is on an overview of tapeworm infections. So we're going to talk about several different species of tapeworms that cause infections in humans, and then we'll talk about how they're diagnosed and how they're treated. So tapeworms are also known as flatworms, and the reason they are called flatworms is because they are flat in appearance. They actually look like a piece of tape or a measuring tape. They are gastrointestinal parasites of the class cestoda, and they can often be referred to as cestodes. And here's an image of what a tapeworm might look like. There are many different species of tapeworms, but there are several different species of tapeworms that infect humans, where humans are the primary host, and each species of tapeworm often has a different intermediate host, which we'll talk about when we talk about specific species of tapeworms in the next upcoming slides. Tapeworms are found all around the world, but the prevalence of each species varies depending on the geographic location. For instance, the tapeworm known as Hymenolepis nana is most commonly found in the United States, whereas the most common in other parts of the world is Tania saginata, which is more common in Europe, South America, Africa, and Asia. The prevalence of tapeworm infection seems to be on the decline due to improved sanitation, but tapeworm infections still do occur, and they are more common in some parts of the world, including South America, Africa, and Asia. And tapeworms can be important causes of nutrient deficiencies, which we will talk about later on in this lesson. So here is what a tapeworm looks like, and we're going to go into some specific details with regards to the anatomy of a tapeworm. So the tapeworm has a head, which is known as a scolex. So the scolex is where the tapeworm attaches with what are known as suckers. And along with these suckers, some species of tapeworm also have a hook on their scolex as well. As we go down the tapeworm, it leads into an unsegmented neck and the tapeworm becomes flatter in appearance, leading into a segmented body. Each of these segments is known as a proglottid and proglottids contain the eggs that are used to infect other hosts. And a tapeworm has no gastrointestinal system, which means that they have to absorb nutrients from the outside. Now we're going to get into more specific details as to how each tapeworm species infects a human, but in general, a patient is going to be infected with cystocerci by oral ingestion. Cystocerci are these immature forms of a tapeworm that are ingested oftentimes in some meat product. So when a patient ingests the cystocerci, the cystocerci develop into an adult tapeworm. The tapeworm then uses its scolex and the suckers and sometimes a hook on the scolex to attach to gastrointestinal mucosa, which is the inner lining of the intestines. And oftentimes they can reside within the small intestine. So they attach to the gastrointestinal mucosa and they hang there and absorb nutrients through their flat segmented body because they have no gastrointestinal system. And then what happens is mature proglottids, so these little segmented areas of the body, which contain eggs, break off and are excreted in stool. So when I say break off, it literally breaks off. These little segments actually break off of the main chain of the tapeworm. And these are what get excreted in the patient's stool and then enter into the environment to infect other hosts. So that is a brief background on the anatomy and some of the pathophysiology with a tapeworm infection. So now that we know the anatomy and some of the pathophysiology behind a tapeworm infection, we're going to get into more specific detail as to particular species of tapeworm. And the ones that are going to be very important in infecting humans are the following. Tania solium, Tania saginata, Diphylobothrium latum, Hymenolepis nana, and Dipylidium caninum. So we're going to talk about each species and some more specific details as to each in the upcoming slides. Now those species of tapeworms lead to particular signs and symptoms, and each species will have particular characteristic findings which we will talk about later on in this lesson. But even if a patient is infected with one of those species of tapeworm, they may be asymptomatic, meaning that they may have no symptoms at all, which is more common in adult patients, whereas in children, if they have a tapeworm infection, they often have a sign or symptom or some response to that tapeworm. When patients do tend to have signs and symptoms of a tapeworm infection, they often have vague gastrointestinal symptoms, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Some of the more important signs and symptoms of a tapeworm infection include passage of proglottids in the stool. So actually seeing some of these proglottids being passed in the stool so they can appear as white or yellow pieces in the stool. Along with passage of these proglottids, there can be anal irritation and pruritus, which is itching. 
Patients can also have abdominal pain. Oftentimes, this abdominal pain is going to be worse in the morning, and it's going to be relieved with small amounts of food. Some patients may experience nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, although this is going to be more common in younger patients. Patients can also have appetite changes, meaning that they can have an increase in appetite or a decrease in appetite. And then some patients can have weight loss. You can imagine that if they have a large number of tapeworms, those tapeworms are absorbing nutrients and preventing the patient from getting those nutrients. So that's going to lead to weight loss. And there are other signs and symptoms that can occur as well, including irritability and headache. If you want more information on all the signs and symptoms, including complications of a tapeworm infection, please check out my full lesson on the signs and symptoms of a tapeworm infection. Now that we've talked about those signs and symptoms that are common among the species of tapeworm we're going to talk about in this lesson, let's get into more specific detail as to each species. So we're first going to talk about Tania solium. So Tania solium, we're first going to look at a diagram as to how patients are infected with this type of tapeworm. It all starts out with these proglottids and eggs in the environment. So it's passed in the feces, these proglottids are passed in the feces into the environment. And what happens is cattle or pigs, in the case of Tania solium, it's going to be pigs. Pigs will then become infected by these eggs by ingestion of vegetation that's contaminated. So what will then happen is that the oncospheres, so this is a stage of the tapeworm, oncospheres hatch and penetrate intestinal wall and circulate through the pig and enter into the musculature of the pig. And then oncospheres develop into cystocerci in the muscle. So these little cystocerci reside in the muscle of the pig. And then what happens is a human will then eat or ingest undercooked or uncooked infected meat. So this is why Tania solium is called the pork tapeworm. And an infection with this tapeworm, Tania solium, and the other Tania species, Tania saginata, which we'll talk about in the next slide, both lead to the condition known as Taniasis. With regards to this particular tapeworm, the intermediate host is a pig. And again, we get it from undercooked or uncooked pork. Maturation of this particular tapeworm is within 5 to 12 weeks. So if a patient does ingest an infected piece of meat that contains cystocerci, it takes about 5 to 12 weeks for that cystocerci to mature into an adult tapeworm. And the important thing about tanisolium is that it may cause cystocercosis or neurocystocercosis. So cystocercosis occurs when a human actually themselves ingests these proglottids or these eggs. So it can either happen through auto infection. So if they are infected with Tania solium and they release these proglottids and eggs into the environment and they don't wash their hands properly, there's improper sanitation, they can actually ingest those eggs and or proglottids and then end up being or acting like the intermediate host where oncospheres hatch inside the patient and then the oncospheres then penetrate the intestinal wall and circulate through the patient's body into certain areas of the body including the liver which would cause cystocercosis so there would be cysts or cystocerci in the liver and what's most important about this condition is that these cystocerci can often enter into the eyes of a patient and into the brain or the central nervous system and that will lead into the condition known as neurocystocercosis so what happens is if cystocerci end up in certain organ systems the patient's immune system often rids the patient of those cystocerci but in the case where the cystocerci are in the eyes or in the central nervous system, the patient's immune system doesn't often take care of them. So they often end up having these cystocerci within the brain or the eyes. And that's going to be important because it leads to the condition known as neurocystocercosis, which has particular signs and symptoms, which we talk about in another lesson. Now let's talk about the next tapeworm species known as Tania saginata. So this is the same diagram we saw in the last slide. And again, it's the same mechanism, except in this case, it is cattle that is the intermediate host. So a patient that's infected with Tania saginata releases eggs or these proglottids into the environment. Cattle then ingest the infected or contaminated vegetation. The oncospheres then hatch and penetrate the intestinal wall of the cow and circulate through the cow and enter into musculature, where they end up developing into cystocerci in muscle. And then a patient then consumes undercooked or uncooked beef products. So this is often considered the beef or cow tapeworm. And again, remember that infection with Tania solium and Tania saginata lead to taniasis. And again, the intermediate host is cattle. And a patient gets this tapeworm from uncooked or undercooked beef. 
And the maturation process for this particular Tania species is 10 to 12 weeks. So it takes about 10 to 12 weeks for Cystocerci to become a mature adult tapeworm in an infected patient. So this is one of the species of tapeworms that has been nearly eradicated in North America due to improved sanitation, but there does still seem to be a low prevalence of it in North America. So it's likely that it's less than 1% of the population that may have this particular tapeworm. And once a patient has been infected with both of these Tania species, the tapeworm itself can actually have a quite a long lifespan. It can actually live up to 25 years. So that is also very interesting as well. The next tapeworm we're going to talk about is Diphylobothrium latum. So here is a diagram as to how a patient gets infected with Diphylobothrium latum. This particular tapeworm has a different mechanism of infection. It has multiple intermediate hosts. So what happens is when a patient is infected with Diphylobothrium latum, they release unembryonated eggs through their feces into the environment. And then these eggs will then enter into a water source. And then what will happen is they will embryonate in the water. They will then become a coracidia. So coracidia hatch from the eggs and then are ingested themselves by crustaceans. So small crustaceans in the water will actually then ingest these coracidia. The coracidia that has entered into the crustacean will then become a procercoid larva in the body of the crustacean. Then what will happen is a small freshwater fish will then ingest the infected crustacean, the procercoid larva will be released from the crustacean and then develop into the next phase of development known as the pleurocercoid larva. And then a larger fish will come along and then eat the infected small fish and then itself become infected. And then what will happen is that a human will come along and then eat that larger fish raw or undercooked. And then the pleurocercoid larva will then develop into an adult tapeworm and then the cycle will continue. Being infected with Diphylobothrium latum leads to the condition known as Diphylobothriasis. Diphylobothrium latum is also known as the fish tapeworm. And again, it comes from uncooked or undercooked fish. So this can be found in sushi or sashimi or some other different types of dishes that consist of raw or undercooked fish. And Diphylobothrium latum is actually the largest or longest parasite in humans, ranging from 2 meters up to 15 meters in length, so it can be very long. And what's important about Diphylobothrium latum is that it causes vitamin B12 deficiency. It's more likely to cause vitamin B12 deficiency in patients who have had the tapeworm for a very long time or if the tapeworm is very long. This tapeworm also can live up to 25 years, so it can live for a very long time as well. So this tapeworm used to be more common in Japan and some of the Scandinavian countries and in some parts of North America as well. But due to preventative measures, it does appear to be on the decline as well. But because raw fish through consumption of sushi and sashimi continues to be popular, this tapeworm may still be around. So it's also important to think about when thinking about possible tapeworm infections. The next tapeworm species we're going to talk about is Hymenolepis nana. So here is another diagram of how Hymenolepis nana infects humans. So what happens is if a human is infected with Hymenolepis nana, they release embryonated eggs in their feces. That egg is then ingested by an insect and then a cystocercoi develops in the insect and then a human patient will inadvertently ingest that cystocercoid infected insect or arthropod. This can also happen in rodents as well and then that will lead to the development of an adult tapeworm. So what can also happen is that the patient can auto infect themselves so they don't even have to go through the insect intermediate. They can release the embryonated egg in their feces and then due to improper hygiene they can end up leading to ingestion of that embryonated egg from contaminated food, water, or hands. And then what can also happen with this particular species of tapeworm is that there can be internal auto-infection. So when the tapeworm is an adult, it can release these proglottids and release eggs inside the patient's intestinal tract. And in some cases, those eggs can either be passed in the feces or they can remain in the intestine. And then the eggs themselves can then release the hexacanth embryo which then penetrates the intestinal villus continuing the cycle so it can then enter and continue this cycle where it can regenerate and produce another adult tapeworm. So infection with hymenolepis nana leads to the condition known as hymenolepiasis. 
This tapeworm species often is considered not to have an intermediate host because it can be passed human to human, so there can be human to human transmission, but arthropods could be considered an intermediate host in this case. And with regards to this particular tapeworm, it can undergo internal auto infection. And as I mentioned before, it's the most commonly diagnosed tapeworm infection in the USA. What can happen with Hymenolepis nana infections is that in addition to the signs and symptoms we talked about earlier on in this lesson, it can lead to pruritus, so itching sensation, so there can be rash and itching, and there can also be nasal pruritus with these types of infections. So patients can have an itchy or runny nose as well, and sneezing can also occur. So this can also occur with a Hymenolepis nana infection. And then the next tapeworm species is Dipylidium caninum. So here is a diagram as to how Dipylidium caninum infects humans. So what happens here is that a dog or a cat is required to have the tapeworm. So they are infected with Dipylidium caninum. They release proglottids in egg packets into the environment. So in addition to requiring a cat or dog to have this tapeworm, they also have to have fleas. So what will happen is after they've released these egg packets into the environment through their feces, a flea larva will then ingest the egg packets and then onchocerus will hatch and develop into cystocircoids within the flea larva. The flea larva will then mature into an adult flea, which will then continue to harbor the infective cystocircoids. And then what's supposed to happen is that the cats or the dogs are supposed to ingest these fleas and continue the cycle. But in some cases, a human might accidentally ingest one of these infected fleas. When that happens, there is incidental human transmission. And then that flea with that cystocircoid will then enter into the human and then lead to a tapeworm infection. So that cystocircoid will then develop into an adult tapeworm. So that particular tapeworm, Dipylidium caninum, is supposed to be in cats and dogs, but it can, in some cases, enter into humans through inadvertent ingestion of an infected flea. The condition of being infected with Dipylidium caninum is known as Dipylidiasis. And again, the hosts are cats and dogs, and the intermediate host in this case would be fleas, but humans can be inadvertent hosts to this particular tapeworm. So humans become infected again by inadvertent ingestion of a cat or dog flea that contains cystocircoids. This is more likely to occur in children, and overall the risk to humans is otherwise low. Some particular characteristics with regards to some of the signs and symptoms that can occur from a Dipylidium caninum infection, along with the GI symptoms we talked about before, they can also have pruritus, so an itching sensation and a rash that can occur as well due to an allergic reaction to the particular tapeworm. So those were all of the important species of tapeworms that can infect humans and some of the pathophysiology behind how they infect humans. Now let's talk about how clinicians diagnose and treat a tapeworm infection. So the diagnosis of a tapeworm infection is by doing a stool, ova, and parasites. So looking at a patient's stool for ova and parasites, so looking for the eggs from a particular tapeworm, or looking for the tapeworms themselves. What's going to be important with looking at the stool of a particular patient, two to three stool samples are often required, and it's important to take those stool samples on different days. Because in some cases, it may not show up. It may not actually be observed if it is only one stool sample. So two to three stool samples on different days is going to be best here. Another way to diagnose is by using cellophane tape. So this can actually help to diagnose particularly Tania saginata eggs. Another way of diagnosing is through copro PCR. So looking for the genetics of a tapeworm. Another way of diagnosing is through Copro AG ELISA, which is serology testing. So this is another way to see if a patient is infected with a particular tapeworm. And then when looking at other blood work, a patient is often going to have mild eosinophilia. So mild increase in eosinophils. Eosinophils are important in fighting parasitic infections. So this is why we can see a mild increase in eosinophil levels. Imaging can be also utilized in some cases. So MRI and CT scan. And when to use this is when there is some suspicion of neurocysticercosis. So that condition when there are cysticerci within the central nervous system. So in this image, you can see these little cysts, which is indicative of a tania solium infection. How do clinicians treat these conditions? So all these conditions can be treated with anti-helminth therapy. So praziquantel, niclosamide, and albendazole. Albendazole is going to be more important in the case of neurocysticercosis. And then some other important treatments and 
Supplements that can be used include vitamin B12 supplementation in the case where a patient has a diphlobothrium latum infection. If they have a vitamin B12 deficiency, which is something I didn't mention here, but it's important to look out for if you're suspecting a particular tapeworm infection. It can be given intramuscularly because the patient may have issues with absorption of vitamin B12. So giving it IM may be the best way of giving it back to the patient. And then anti-epileptics or anti-seizure medication can be important in some cases of neurocystisarcosis, which can cause seizures to occur. So that's another important treatment in the case of neurocystisarcosis. So again, for the diagnosis of these tapeworm infections, the most commonly used is going to be the stool oven parasites, and it's best to do two to three stool samples on different days. There are some other ways of diagnosing as well, as we mentioned here. Imaging, again, for neurocystisarcosis. These treatments are going to be important for all tapeworm infections. And I didn't mention it before, but praziquantel and albendazole together are often going to be the treatment for neurocystisarcosis. And then we can also see vitamin B12 supplementation being important for a diphlobothrium latum infection and then anti-epileptics again for neurocystisarcosis. Now let's talk about ways to prevent a tapeworm infection. So hand hygiene is going to be very important. We talked about some of those cases of auto infection. So it's going to be very important to have very good hand hygiene. It's also important to wash fruits and vegetables before use. There may be some eggs or proglottids that have contaminated those fruits and vegetables. Improved sanitation in general is going to be important. So this can occur on agricultural lands or sewage treatment. So sewage treatment has been noted to reduce the risk of diphlobothrium latum infections because as we mentioned before, eggs are released into the water sources and then they embryonate and then are picked up by crustaceans. So treating the sewage prior to it being released into the environment can help reduce the risk of diphlobothrium latum infections. Flea control is going to be important if you have pets, so that can help reduce the risk of a dipylidium caninum infection. And then it's also important to ensure that meat products are cooked to at least 165 degrees Fahrenheit or at least 74 degrees Celsius. This can help neutralize or kill the cystocerci within the meat. And then flash freezing fish can help neutralize diphlobothrium latum. So it's going to be flash freezing at temperatures of minus 31 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 35 degrees Celsius or lower than that for at least 15 to 24 hours or minus 20 degrees Celsius or lower for at least seven days. And then in the case of certain meats, we can have these low temperatures, minus 31 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 35 degrees Celsius for at least seven to 10 days. And that may help neutralize some of those cystocerci within the meat. So that is also another way of helping to prevent the spread of tapeworm infections. If you wanna learn more about the signs and symptoms of a tapeworm infection, please check my lesson on that topic. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thank you so much for watching and hope to see you next time.